So at this point in your chemistry career, you are no doubt um, familiar with the concept of chemical equilibrium. So we're going to do a quick sort of a reminder review of, of what you know uh, and frame it from the big picture because we're going to talk a lot about chemical equilibrium in this class and we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about some of the nuances that you um, probably haven't seen in other courses yet. So chemical equilibrium really is the, is the bedrock of chemistry. It's the concept that really governs uh, the steady state of all of the things around us. Uh, it's operative in uh, chemistry, of course, but geology, um, molecular biology, biochemistry, oceanography, um, all fields really um, function on the premise of equilibrium, not to mention atmospheric science, environmental science, etc. Um, every reaction that we consider, every chemical reaction, has some equilibrium associated with it. Um, the equilibrium for a reaction is sort of the, it's the, if you think about it from a, from a big picture, it's, it's really how much of the reactant and how much of the product you have uh, when the reaction is um, macroscopically not changing. In other words, if you've got a round bottom flask and you've got these components uh, in this reaction inside of here, uh, macroscopically, if the reaction is at, uh, at equilibrium, we are observing no change in the concentration of the reactants and the concentration of the products. And we consider that the steady state. Uh, does that mean nothing's happening? Of course not. It means that the reaction is proceeding in both directions at a constant rate. So um, at the microscopic level, we would be seeing this rapid construction of molecules and destruction of molecules as the reaction proceeds in both directions simultaneously. But the net effect of that, what we observe with our eyes uh, at the macroscopic level is no change in the system. The system is, is fixed and constant. Uh, that's not to say that these two concentrations of reactant and product are equal. Um, uh, quite the contrary, in fact, uh, depending on where the equilibrium lies, uh, which is a function of bigger components of thermodynamics, uh, we could have almost everything in the form of the product or almost everything in the form of the reactant or somewhere in between. And that concept, uh, the fact that the equilibrium can lie in either direction, of course, it's really important. You've thought about it in general chemistry and organic chemistry, etc. In analytical chemistry, when we're trying to design reactions such that um, we can use them to measure uh, the concentration of species in a solution, we really have to be careful about what equilibrium is and what it means and how it influences what exactly is in solution at any given moment in time. So our formalism for equilibrium uh, often lies on what we call the equilibrium constant, which is this capital letter K constant uh, from German word constant. And um, this notion of, of uh, sort of the balance of reactants and products and concentration can be formalized algebraically by saying that it's going to be the concentration of this product C raised to the Cth power, whatever that coefficient is, multiplied by the concentration of the raised to that small d power, whatever the coefficient is, divided by a to the a and b to the b. And really what we're saying here, and you've heard this a million times probably, is this is the concentration of the products, uh, the product of the products, uh, divided by the concentration of the reactants. And this is our steady state equilibrium. Uh, wherever that system lies, whether it's to the right, in which case we have a much higher concentration of C and D, uh, and a lower concentration of A and B, which means we have a large equilibrium constant, or if it lies to the left, where we have a high concentration of the denominator, low concentration of the numerator, and our equilibrium constant represents a smaller value in that case. When we think about this equilibrium constant, um, you're all familiar, if you've taken at least a uh, organic chemistry course, that, that this K, uh, we have a variety of flavors of K. Uh, we could have something like Ka, or Kb, or Keq, or Ks, 
uh, for um, a whole bunch of different things. And those Ks, they're all the same. They're all concentration of products divided by concentration of reactants. The subscript there just refers to what type of reaction we're talking about there. So for Ka, we know we're talking about acid dissociation. Uh, for Kb, we're talking about base association. K equilibrium is a generic. We're often talking about things that are um, just generic reactions. Um, Ks often, uh, or Ksp, depending on what textbook you're using, uh, often relates to solubility or precipitation type reactions, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So don't be confused by the different flavors of the equilibrium constant. They all mean exactly the same thing. We just use the subscript to denote the specific type of reaction that that equilibrium constant is applying to. So the phenomenon of equilibrium is, is, is um, you know, it, it it seems incidental because um, this description alone does nothing to tell us its origin, right? There's nothing about the representation of the equilibrium constant itself that tells us why uh, a constant would be um, large or small or why a reaction would proceed more towards products than uh, the reactants. For that, we need a little bit of thermodynamic formalism. So uh, you've all seen this before. When we think about um, this K value, how does it relate to more fundamental parameters of thermodynamics? Well, it comes from this expression where K is equal to uh, the exponent here of uh, negative delta G under standard conditions uh, divided by RT to make the units work. Um, well, what does this mean? We've all seen this before. Well, <laughs> delta G, you know, to be probably the most important parameter as a predictive parameter in chemistry. This is, gives free energy, uh, and we know that free energy uh, is more formally defined as uh, the relationship between enthalpy and entropy. So if we're talking about standard states here, we're talking about the free energy is really um, a metric that collects energies for a reaction, two different types of energies, the enthalpy, which uh, under constant pressure conditions relates to the bond energies or the change in bond energies, uh, bonds breaking and bonds being created. That's what the change means as you progress through a reaction. And delta S is our entropy, which has to do with disorder or randomness in a simple way. Uh, and that's weighted by whatever the temperature of the reaction is. So that uh, entropy term gets more pronounced as the temperature increases in this case. And so delta H and delta S here are sort of balancing each other. And delta G is a metric that collects both of them. Both of these are energies. So H and S both can be measured in joules, right? They're just different ways that energy manifests, and same with delta G. Delta G is also measured in joules. So we know that delta G, when this is a negative value, what that actually means is if we have G, our free energy, and the reaction as it proceeds, or a reaction coordinate, if that's negative, uh, that means that we're starting at an initial state of our reactants, and we're proceeding to a final state where our products are. If, if this is the case, then we have a net reduction in energy in the system. That energy goes out to the universe. The universe likes that. Uh, that means we call this type of reaction a spontaneous one. Uh, and it's one that a reaction would prefer to do, right? Because this is like rolling a ball down the hill. So anytime you have a net reduction in energy of the system, the free energy of the system, which again is a composite, both of the bond energies of the reaction and the entropy, you have to include both of those, um, then we can consider whether or not this thing is, is spontaneous or not. Um, the opposite is true. Again, if we have a positive value for delta G, that means we're starting at a low energy and we're increasing the energy of the system. Where does that energy have to come from? Well, the universe out here, right? The universe has to input that energy. The universe doesn't want to put input that energy, at least spontaneously or naturally. So we call this a non-spontaneous reaction, which means we need to get that energy and harvest it and put it into the system to get it to go uphill. So why all this talk? Well, this delta G is this same delta G here, which is fundamentally related to K. So where K lies, K being if this is greater than one, then uh, we have more products in solution. If it's less than one, we have more reactants in solution. It's fundamentally related to 
delta G, which is again a pr proxy of enthalpy and, and entropy. And so all of these terms are intimate re intimately related. And so the extent of a reaction where it lies in product versus reactant space is purely a function of the shape of this curve, uh, how the delta G is changing uh, with respect to the reaction coordinate over time. So when we think about equilibrium in delta G, uh, equilibrium is achieved when delta G is equal to zero. Uh, because at that point, there's actually no driving force. You can sort of imagine uh, G being this parabolic shape where um, if we have too many reactants, then we're falling down and down until we reach the minimum in terms of free energy of the system. But if we start to have too many products, now uh, the reaction starts to run in the opposite direction until it minimizes the free energy of the system. This is what all things in the universe are trying to do, not just chemical systems. All things are trying to minimize the free energy of the system. And they do that uh, ideally when the equilibrium is uh, reached and that's when the free energy change, the actual change in free energy of the system is zero because then there's no incentive for the reaction to run in either direction. It's running in both directions but at the same rate uh, and so there's no net change in the system. So of course a system that is at equilibrium where the delta G of the system is zero uh, could be perturbed if we say were to add a whole bunch more reactant to the system that was at, re at equilibrium. That means that the, the system is going to rapidly struggle um, to re-equilibrate and it's going to have to eat up and churn through all that new reactant that you uh, just added and it's going to shove the reactant towards the products uh, very quickly. Same goes if we tossed in a bunch of new products then it's going to run in reverse to destroy those products to reach back to its equilibrium state which is defined by K, right? K is always going to be the concentration of the products over the reactants, which means that the concentration, these concentrations of products and reactants are fixed, right? By this constant. This is a constant. It's unchanging, right? Uh, more or less. I mean, it does change with temperature. But if we were to add a whole bunch more products to the system, that ramps this value up. Of course, that it then is going to cause the system to be perturbed. We're going to have to use up those products, and it's going to run the reaction in reverse such that this ratio rebalances to provide us back to K. That's the whole premise of, of equilibrium. And qualitatively, that description for how an equilibrium system or a system at equilibrium responds to perturbation is called the Chalier's principle, which, which I think we all know intuitively pretty well. So if we use this um, chromium bromate redox system uh, as an example, this is actually a, a standard redox titration that you can do. Um, we have on the left collected uh, a whole slew of uh, reactants. And then on the right, we have our um, components that are produced, our products. Uh, so we can draft up a, an equilibrium expression for this, which will always just be the concentration of the products divided by uh, the concentration of the reactants. And then we're going to raise uh, each of those concentrations to the power, whatever the coefficient is, to balance that system. In this case, um, bromide is 1, so we don't change the coefficient there. This is uh, chromate or dichromate, uh, 2 minus. Uh, that's also 1. We have H plus here raised to the 8th power. And then we have... Uh, water, the fourth, uh, and you'll, you may catch my error here, uh, chromium, three plus, squared, and bromate ion uh, to the first. What do we know about uh, these values? Um, there's, this comes from a formalism. You may remember this, you may not, but um, when we're thinking about uh, crafting an equilibrium expression, we actually don't include any pure substances, so anything that's liquid or solid. In this case, water is a pure liquid, which means it's actually it gets struck from the expression. We don't include it because it's essentially at an infinite concentration. It's our solvent, uh, so it doesn't change our equilibrium, which are all species that are dissolved in this case. Um, at the same time, the formalism here is that anything, um, any aqueous system or any solute that's dissolved in something. Uh, 
gets input into this expression in units of molarity, moles per liter, that's important. At the same time, anything with units of pressure gets input with units bar. Um, and by convention, the way that these um, are equated to each other, the reason why the uh, equilibrium constant is always unitless, even though it doesn't appear it should be, right? If we had molar times molar times molar to the eighth over molar squared times molar, all those molars don't cancel out, right? Um, so if you don't remember, implicit in the definition of any time you construct an equilibrium constant expression like this, all of the concentrations of your species are actually then going to be divided by the concentration of that species under standard state conditions. So for example, when we write bromide like this, what we're actually implying when we write that is bromide divided by one molar, because that's a standard state condition for that ion. When we write H+, plus, we're actually considering H plus to the eighth over one molar to the eighth. And that's why those molars actually will cancel um, in each case, and so each one of these inputs into the equilibrium expression becomes a unitless, which ultimately gives you a unitless uh, equilibrium constant. The same is true for anything in units of pressure. So instead, say we have a reaction that had hydrogen gas, um, instead of writing it as concentration like this, we would often write it P with subscript whatever the gas is, hydrogen, and the implied definition here would be that that would be divided by uh, whatever its standard state condition is, which is one bar. So we're dividing the pressure in bars divided by the standard state, which is bars. Feels like semantics, but it's really important once you start thinking about what does this really mean? So the equilibrium, equilibrium constant for this redox reaction is one times 10 to the fourth here um, at 25 degrees C. Um, that means that the uh, concentration of the products is roughly 10,000 times the concentration of the reactants at equilibrium, right? So this is product favored um, in this case. Um, so what happens if we think about the Le Chatelier's principle, if we were to all of a sudden, you know, we have this system, it's in a beaker or it's in a flask, whatever it is, it's at equilibrium, so it's happy, everything is at its equilibrium concentrations, and then we just go ahead and we toss in a whole bunch of more dichromate from a uh, burette, right? This is a titration. So I toss this in, a bunch of dichromate pops into this thing. What happens to our system, all right? Chalier's principle will say, well, if the concentration of this thing ramps up, then the concentration in this expression ramps up, but this constant needs to be satisfied, right? This is, this is a constant. This is what the concentration of these things should be at equilibrium, which means you're no longer at e equilibrium. So what do you have to do with that? Well, if this ramped up, then you have to get it back down. So if you need to get it back down, what direction does this reaction need to run? Well, it needs to run backwards so that you chew up some of that dichromate molecule. So it runs in reverse uh, and drops back down. When you're not at equilibrium and you want to compute what is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants, we don't call that K anymore because K is only reserved for what the concentrations are at equilibrium. So away from equilibrium, we call that the reaction quotient and we call that Q. So if we were to ramp up the concentration of dichromate and we're no longer at equilibrium, we pop that number in for dichromate, we compute a value, then we will end up with a, a value of Q. When Q uh, is in excess of K, what does that mean? Well, it means you have more product than you do reactant uh, at what it should be at equilibrium, which means that the reaction is going to run in the reverse until Q equals K again. Uh, if Q is less than K, it means you have an excess of um, reactant in the system, which means the reaction needs to chew up some of that reactant. It's going to run and progress in the forward direction until, again, Q equals K. When Q equals K, we're at equilibrium and everything's steady state again.